What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down, a Mafia History Podcast. I am your host, Jeff Nado. We are back here with another week and another show, another sit down. We got a huge show planned for today, and I got to tell you, I am super excited for this one. We're going to talk about Sonny Franzese. Uh, you know, I think we're about 30 shows in, and I have been so looking forward to this one. Uh, this is to me, Sonny Renzi is a man's man. Uh, I think when we look back at, for everyone that wasn't a boss, I don't know if there was anyone more powerful that wasn't a boss than Sonny. Um, he's a guy that lived one of the more fascinating mob lives that I've ever seen. Um, I think for this episode, I really prided myself on just the the detail, I think, that we we, we were able to get on Sonny. Uh, and I'm interested in hearing you hear more about him. This is a guy that it was the longest living mobster ever. I mean, this is a guy that lived into his hundreds and there's no one that lived that long. There's no one that, you know, really outside of one or two that spent their nineties in prison. You know, he's a guy that really embodied Cosa Nostra. He would never break up Marita. This is a guy that really wanted to stick it to the government. You know, this is a guy that you know, did a lot of bad things. Interestingly enough, he would end up going to prison for something he didn't actually do, as far as most people are concerned. This is a guy that had an affair with Marilyn Monroe. This is a guy that made tons of money. And this is a guy that, sadly, his two sons followed him into the life. And ultimately, his uh, betrayal of one of his family members was really the end for him. Um, so we're going to talk about all that and more. It's just me today on the show. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to it. No Q and A's, no news, no nothing. We're just going to get no frills right in to Sunny Vranzi's here on the sit down. As always, before we get to that, just want to let all of you know, make sure uh, you're checking out all of our sponsors. We recently partnered uh, with a company called Airwave Media and Airwave is going to help us um, really kind of align with, with, with partnerships and ads that allow us to make some money for this show. So we urge you, go check out uh, all of our sponsors. We are a growing podcast. And once you grow, companies want to work with you. So make sure you go frequent them. This is a free show. We don't charge you anything for it. We just ask that you follow us on Twitter, get involved when we ask you to, and uh, support our sponsors. So uh, go do that. As I said, follow us on Twitter at the sit down seven. And we're also on YouTube. Uh, we're getting close to a thousand subscribers. So I please urge you go check us out the sit down and mafia history podcast on YouTube. Uh, I'll start including that in uh, some of our tweets and stuff. Um, as I said, we're getting closer and closer to a thousand and over there, you're going to get little shorter episodes of the show, uh, five or 10 minute shorts on uh, different mobsters that you've never heard of and live streams and interviews and things like that. So make sure you check all that stuff out as well. All right. Let's get to the particulars. Let's get to Sonny Franzese on the sit down. John Franzese was born February 6th, 1917. He was born in Naples, which is obviously in Italy. Uh, and in interestingly enough, um, his parents, Carmine and Maria, uh, they actually um, by this point had already immigrated to the United States. But uh, during their uh, the pregnancy, they actually went back to Italy for a visit, and that's where uh, Sonny would be born. Uh, after just a couple of months, the family would come back to Brooklyn. They were from Greenpoint, and they would live at 316 Leonard Street, right in Greenpoint. Now, um, Sonny came from a big family. Uh, it was said that he came from a 16 children family, a lot of kids, a lot of mouths to feed, uh, and a lot of um, you know, trials and tribulations over the years. It's interesting because as a young kid, um, his father would actually run a bakery. That was his day job. Um, Sonny would, would move around in the bakery a little bit, but Sonny's mother would claim that he had been bad since birth and that he had been bad in, even inside her stomach. Um, so I think legend would have it that Sonny Vranzis was really born criminal, <laughs> a born criminal. Now, again, didn't have any criminal his father wasn't a criminal or anything like that. But, um, you know, this is a guy that in that time, in those days, uh, you know, in the 1910s uh, and 20s, you know, New York was a breeding ground for young men, particularly immigrant young men that uh, wanted to feel like they belonged. Uh, in 1933, uh, or, or really even before then, you know, you're talking about, you know, 19, early 1930s. 
it was said that Sonny Vrenzies was already made. Now he wasn't made. Uh, he was only in his teens, early teens, but you, he was so immersed in mob life. He ran a craps game. He was working for people under Joe Profaci um, that they would joke around that he had already been made, that he had been made since he was 14. There was also a legend that he had actually committed a homicide by that age as well. Um, now I went and tried to really delve into Sonny's life. I didn't find anything uh, as far as fact that say that he killed someone or there was record of him killing someone at 14, but uh, it's definitely possible. Um, this is a guy that, uh, you know, again, was very much in that life uh, and was in it very early. Now, it's important to understand in the early 30s what the Colombo crime family looked like. At that time, it was a family that really was just being organized. Remember, in the early 30s, Lucky Luciano basically takes control of the American mafia as we know it. He eliminates Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano. He then gets everyone together and says, we're going to make this a uh, five-headed group. Uh, everyone's going to have a family. We're going to have five families. Uh, and I'm going to act as the leader of this group called the commission. Now, one of the families that he organized was the Profaci crime family. And the boss of that family was a guy called Joe Profaci. He controlled uh, numbers and loan sharking and drugs and everything that was done in Brooklyn. So they kind of did it almost like the five boroughs. He was the, the Brooklyn guy and he got his own family. So, you know, working under Joe Profaci, Sonny Franzese really learned the game. Uh, and learned, um, you know, really all sorts of things. It was said that early in um, his life, he actually uh, worked under um, the like the Joe Magliaccio wing. Uh, Joe Magliaccio had a, a in-law called Salvatore Musaccio. They called him Sally the Shake. Uh, it was said that he was actually the mentor to Sonny Frenzies. Now, you know, it's interesting because, like I said, whenever I, uh, I do a show on someone, I, I try to like go to the ends of the earth to find stuff about them. Um, there is very little to know about Salvatore, Sally the Sheikh, Musaccio. He is very tough to find information on. But from what I know, he was an old guy, old school guy. He was uh, obviously related to Joe Magliaccio. Uh, and he was, uh, he was a stone cold gangster. And that's the guy that Sonny Frenzies really uh, – kind of learned the, the game from uh, by 1938 um, he was already getting trouble in trouble with the law and keep in mind Sonny's only 21 by this point he's arrested for assault and in the early 40s as we know the you know the world war was, was coming again there was another world war uh, this one being world war ii and Sonny's actually called on he's drafted in 1942 to go to the united states army but in really a, a fascinating decision it's decided that late that year in 1942, that he's actually psychoneurotic and has pronounced homicidal tendencies. So that makes you wonder how big of a lunatic Sonny Frenzies actually was. I mean, keep in mind, he was told that he couldn't join a war that they drafted him into. They wanted people with homicidal tendencies, but he was that fucked up in the head, seemingly. So they told him, well, you know what? You're almost too much of a killer. We don't want you. And he went home and returned back to Brooklyn. Pretty crazy. During the 40s and by 1949, Sonny was making a lot of money. He was moving around in the game. He was killing people. And he was made that year. So you know, basically in his early 30s, Sonny Vrenzies was a made man in the Pafachi crime family. It's a huge jump. And it's a huge leap to make at such a young age. Um, and once he was made, he was put into the crew of Buster Alloy. Um, Buster Alloy was uh, the brother, or sorry, the father of, a, uh, of an acting boss at one point, Vincenzo, Vincenzo Allo. Uh, and he would work out of Brooklyn and he would kind of work uh, under uh, Buster. In the mid 50s, Things were going well for Sonny Vrenzies. He was making his rounds around town. He was becoming a bit of a playboy. Uh, he actually got married, weirdly enough, but that didn't stop him from going out and being on the town. He was at the Copa. He was at the Stork Club. He was meeting Frank Sinatra. He was meeting Rocky Graziano. He was meeting all these famous people and athletes. And you know, he was making a lot of money. He was doing things in, 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 in loan sharking. He had a sports betting business. 
Um, you know, he was doing everything he could to earn, to kick up and to make it known that he was an important part of the Fauci crime family. And that's what you do. You earn, you kick up, you do what you have to do. Um, obviously towards you know, the end of the fifties, you're starting to see some moves in some of the different families. And one of the big things that we saw really towards the end of the fifties and into the early sixties was the Gallo Perfacci war. So as we know, Joe Gallo becomes disillusioned and sick of Joe Perfacci because he's kind of tying everybody's hands. He's not letting them make money and they kill, uh, and when I say they, the Profacci's kill Franco Batamarco, who is the Gallo's um, kind of mentor and the guy that uh, brought them up. They start kidnapping all sorts of Profacci people, uh, including Joe Colombo. And Sonny Franzese actually acted as a mediator to uh, both sides. He was close with Profacci group. He knew the Gallo's and he kind of mediated things. And this is something that would allow and really leap Sonny Franzese into the hierarchy of the... Colombo crime family. Uh, by 1962, Joe Profaccio would die and Joe Colombo would be the new boss. And by 1963, he had done such a good job, Sonny Frenzies, with kind of mediating the war and ending the war uh, that Joe Colombo would actually promote him to underboss of the family. And this was huge because you know he had his own crew by this point. He was doing all of his own stuff and he actually moved all of his operations out to Long Island. Several of the people that were in his crew were Albert Mayone, Lawrence Messina, George Papa George, uh, Dominic Mimi Schiallo, uh, and others. So, you know, he was creating a group of guys that, you know, were earners. Uh, and Michael's family was growing. Keep in mind, as I mentioned a little bit before, during the 50s, Michael, or sorry, uh, Sonny uh, got married. Um, and there's not a lot known about his first wife, but during his time kind of being a playboy and doing his thing, he goes out to the store club, a place that, you know, all the to do people went, whether you were famous or rich or whatever. Uh, and he goes in there and he goes into the coat room and meets a young uh, woman called Christina Copa Bianco. Now, Christina was young. She was 16 years old. She was a teenager. Um, they have a relationship uh, and she becomes pregnant with uh, a son. A uh, son she would later name Michael. Now, remember, um, one of the things that Michael Franzese has talked about is it's unknown as to if Sonny Franzese is his actual father. A lot of that has to do with the fact that John Franzese did not disclose to Copa Bianca that he was actually married. And keep in mind, Copa Bianca was involved with an individual, Frank Grillo. Now, you know, if you know anything about Michael, he actually used the name Michael Grillo for part of his life. Um, you know, Michael believed that he would actually be adopted by John and that uh, Grillo may be his biological father, but he had been divorced and that Sonny kind of raised him. So it's a lot of confusion, but, you know, in a roundabout way, Christina Tina Copa Bianca would become Sonny's long-term partner and his wife. She would eventually give him more children. Um, but one of the big things about Michael is nobody knows for sure. I believe on Vlad TV, he mentioned that he, they've never taken DNA tests, but he doesn't really care either way. Sonny was the one that raised him. So, you know, that's kind of important to talk about. Um, but everything was going good for Sonny Frenzies. He had a family, he was having sons, uh, he was making money and it would come time for him. Obviously he was getting a lot of power. He would move his operations at the Long Island, and he would actually get a home. Uh, the Franzeses would live on Shrub Hollow Road and Stonegate Drive, basically the corner of that uh, intersection in Roslyn, Long Island. Um, and if you talk to the neighbors about Sonny Frenzies, they would tell you how wonderful he was. He was an interesting, great guy. Uh, a neighbor would once tell a story that one time she came out to find one of her car tires uh, needed fixed, and Sonny would come out with his suit on, with his bodyguard, and he would take off the suit jacket and uh, hand it to the bodyguard and just start going to work on the car. Uh, she would call him great, a great father. He was a wonderful guy, good man. Um, so, you know, that's the thing about criminals, man. They have these ways of, of, of really being uh, quite, uh, 
quite good and quite nice, at least in the surface, but they have this other side to them where, you know, they can be uh, really evil. Uh, and Sonny Renzi's, uh, by all accounts, was uh, a pretty good guy. In 1964, um, some things would happen, though, that would really kind of set up a long kind of 20-year run where Sonny would really have to face multiple juries. Uh, in 1964, an individual who was said to be a hitman uh, called Ernest the Hawk Rapola would wash up on the shores of Breezy Point, Queens, uh, in the Jamaica Bay. And what happened was Vito Genovese um, ordered Rapola to be killed after it was said that he was a rat. He goes to Frenzies and says, take care of this for me. Frenzies kills him, stabs him, shoots him, whatever. They throw him in the bay. The problem is they didn't drain the blood out and he washed up. He, he just picked pop, pop, pop back up and they found him on the, the shores of, of Greasy Point. So this would set up a big problem for John Franzese because he would be um, accused and, and arrested. He would face um, a jury uh, in 1966. Ultimately, uh, at that point, they would also contend that the prosecution claimed that Sonny had killed up to 50 people. So, you know, they were kind of painting him in, in, in the auspice that he is a hitman. And this is what he does. Uh, he would ultimately be acquitted of the murder. The problem was, and this was a big problem, we all know that the federal government doesn't like to lose. Okay. We saw it with John Gotti. They get to a point where they hate you. And they don't want you to see you move on with their life. And they say, okay, we can't get you on this. So we'll find another way to get you. And it's interesting because before I tell you what happens next, it's important to understand some of the things that Sonny Renzies was doing in his personal life. Now, obviously he had a wife and he had kids, but he was going to the store club and he would tell his son, Michael, many years later, a story about the time that he met Marilyn Monroe. And he talked about going to the store club one night and he walks in and he's there with Frank Costello and Frank uh, says hello to Marilyn. She walks by him and he goes, hey, let me introduce you to my friend, Sonny. Uh, before they know it, Sonny's buying Marilyn a drink. And before you know it, they're betting together. And they had an affair of some sort. And Sonny would talk about this. And he would also tell a story that years later, uh, when she had an affair with RFK, Robert Kennedy, during a sexual escapade, she incorrectly said Sonny instead of Robert. And uh, Robert Kennedy went nuts and went to J. Edgar Hoover and says, who the fuck is this Sonny? We've got to get him, you know, almost like a jealous lover, if you will. And I often wonder, was this a, just a government thing? And he had some hands in it and said, you know what? We can't get this fucking guy on this murder. So in 1967, we're going to arrest him on a string of bank robberies. Now, what the federal government alleges is that a group of individuals was robbing banks in New York. And they contend that these guys were kind of associates to Sonny. And he told them, hey, go out and earn. Uh, and they said, well, we're, we'll rob banks. And he says, okay, this is how you do it. And I'm the one that told you to do it, basically. That's what the government was contending. Now, Michael Frenzies, multiple people that know Michael, um, you know, even people that knew John Frenzies, all of them would contend that they do believe that he was set up on this. This was a frame job. Um, it was also mentioned that Jacob Mishler uh, hated Sonny Frenzies, the judge in this case. Um, he would ultimately be found guilty and be convicted of these uh, masterminding bank robberies. Um, and he would be sentenced to 50 years in prison. He would actually appeal it nine times. Uh, it never worked. And in 1970, he would be shipped off and go to Leavenworth. Um, it was interesting that during the years, it was said that Mishler and Frenzies developed a bit of a back and forth. They didn't like each other. Uh, Frenzies would declare, you watch, I'm going to do the whole 50, as he said to um, Mishler as he walked out of the courtroom. Now, I think a lot of people would say, and I think this is where when we talk about informants, you know, you get hit with 50 years, right? It's like, okay, wow, I get hit with 50 fucking years. Uh, and this is where you're like, you don't want to fuck your family up. You, you don't want to do it. None of that ever happened. And, and FBI agents will talk about, you know, at certain points, they wouldn't even attempt to bring the subject up to frenzies because it was never going to happen. 
he was never going to crack. And there was a quote that came out about Sonny Franzese. He would never rat on anyone, not once in the 89 years from the time that he became a made man at 14 until he drew his last breath in a Queens nursing home. Had Sonny ever violated his sworn, or, sworn worn oath, the Sicilian code of silence. He was a gangster through and through. He had married Cosa Nostra. That was his wife. And when he was convicted of the string of bank robberies, he was quoted as saying, quote, robbing banks is for idiots. And they also asked him, Sonny, why didn't you talk? And he said, uh, you know, that's just not what I do. Uh, he also shrugged it off and said 50 years. Oh, well, it evens out. So, you know, this is a guy that believed in his Cosa Nostra life and he was never going to crack. He was as Cosa Nostra as it gets. It's that simple. Now, the good thing before all this stuff happens with the bank robbery stuff, Sonny Renzese is becoming a very a rich man. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that you know, not only was he in loan sharking, not only was he in bookmaking, not only was he in all the other mob rackets, but Sonny Frenzies was involved in not only in the music business, but the entertainment business in general. Um, this is something that made him a lot of money over the years. Um, obviously, you know, this is a guy that had a big um, and burgeoning um, loan sharking operation in New York, but he was also very involved with adult nightclubs. He was involved with the adult entertainment business up in Times Square with uh, last week's uh, subject, Matt Ionello. Uh, he was involved with a lot of things and the entertainment business was big. I mean, years later, he would produce uh, and finance um, the film Deep Throat. Uh, he was very much involved with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And, um, and when that came out, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, one of the big things that Sonny was really involved with was uh, the music business. And before he went away in 1967, he would develop a financial interest in a record label called Buddha Records, which was formed that year. And this is a label that you know, was doing big things. They were discovering acts like Curtis Mayfield. And one of the things that he also did was, in a way, he almost discovered a young kid called Neil Bogart. Um, Neil Bogart was just a terrific talent scout. He was a guy that would make stars out of, you know, Donna Summer, Kiss, Village People, all these different acts down the road. And Sonny becomes pretty much a silent partner. He'd become close with record exec Morris Levy, who, if you know anything about him, he was very connected with the mafia. And he would use Sonny almost to shake people down and to scare people. One songwriter, Paul Vance, would talk about a situation one time when he was at the Brill Building in New York, which um, would act as you know, kind of a, a place for you know, studio people and that sort of thing. It's a huge building, um, you know, many stories. Uh, and this Paul Vance would talk about how Sonny Renzese and him got into a dispute over royalties on musical acts. There was a song called leader of the laundry mat. And I guess Sonny felt like that was money that was owed to him. And you know, he goes to see Paul Vance and Paul Vance doesn't want to cooperate. So they hang his head out of a, a nine story window. Uh, and, and, and Paul Vance would talk about that many years later. You know, Sonny friends East was the guy that in the music business, if you didn't fucking get down or lay down, you had to deal with him. And he would infiltrate many record labels through, you know, bribing people. And this was also the way that he would launder his money. You know, he would take the loan sharking money and the bookmaking money and the extortion money and all that stuff and put it into legitimate businesses. And this would obviously set up his connection to uh, the movie business down the road. Now, during all this as well, he would come in contact and become close with an individual called Norby Walters. Norby Walters was an agent uh, out in California. He was a nightclub owner. Uh, and Michael and... Sonny's other son, John, would talk about as young adults, they would go on business with their father. And at one point, they met Norby Walters. Uh, they met him at a diner. And, you know, Sonny had been away for a while. And he walks in and sees Norby and says, hey, Norby, you know, you've been making a lot of money while I've been gone. What's our cut now? And you know, Norby basically says, well, you know, you're not my partner anymore. You know, I don't need to pay you anything anymore. And, you know, Sonny just kind of says, well, okay, if that's how you want to play it, so be it. But 
you know, what's your life worth? That's what he says to Norby. And at that point, Norby says, you know what? I think we can make a deal here. Uh, and that's where I think the, the Franzises, at least the sons realized that, you know, you can get a lot further with, uh, you know, kind of leaning on people as opposed to doing it the right way. And we've, we're we not going to do a Sean. This isn't a Sean Michael Franzies, but obviously I think when his father went away for 50 years, I think he realized that, you know, he probably wanted to go the, the Michael Corleone route, go to college or whatever, but he didn't. And he went into the life. And, you know, I don't think Mike or John, the son would have been in the life if not for their father. I think they'll tell you that, but, you know, being a Franzese and having that father, it was just something that you did. Um, so Sonny would go away. He would actually end up getting out um, ultimately in um, 1984. Um you know, completely. But during from 70 until 84, he would actually violate multiple times. He actually violated five different times. Um, so he would like, he would get out in 78, then he would go back in, in 82, and then he would get out and then he would go back and he would ultimately violate a few different times. And a lot of those times were because of his association to uh, criminals and an FBI agent told a story one time when Sonny had gotten out and they were watching him. And one time he goes into a diner and he's sitting there and he's eating pasta for Zool. And he walks in this FBI agent goes, Hey, Sonny, look, uh, he's there hanging out with Colombo guys. And he says, look, Sonny, we got to arrest you. You know, what you can and can't do. You can't be hanging out with, you know, known felons. And Sonny responds, well, okay, that's okay. Um, can I at least finish my pasta for Zool? <laughs> and, and the FBI agent says, well, no, you can't, you got to come with us. And he went with them. But in 1984, uh, Sonny Franzies would completely be uh, released uh, on parole. And he actually, until the 2000s, would not end up going back to prison. Um, one of the things I said that Sonny was big on was not only the music business, but he also was very involved in the film business. Um, and he would you know, act as you know, a consultant on different films and things of that nature. But he was actually bankrolling movies as well. And one of the big films that he was able to put out was a movie called Deep Throat. Um, it was actually a porno, porno film. And this was put out during the quote, you know, golden age of porn. It was Linda Lovelace. It was something though that had a plot. It had character development. It, it was, it, it, you know, it was almost like one of these soft core porn type of films, um, but it did a lot. I mean, it, it, it didn't have a crazy budget. I think the budget was like $45,000. Um, they ended up making huge money on this. And I'm talking, you know, 30 to $50 million, just to put this into perspective, it would be released in 1972 and Deep Throat would gross $1 million in the first seven weeks. Now that's in 1972. That's about six and a half million dollars today. You know, that would be a record. I mean, the, the opening week of any film was like 30 K. I mean, it's crazy. It grows a lot of money. And to this day, in the first six months of release, it is still ranked as one of the top 10 highest grossing films 48 weeks after its release. So, I mean, this is a movie that made a lot of money. And estimates of the total revenues were up to like 600 million, which is like 4 billion today. I mean, it made incredible amounts of money. And this is a film that Sonny Franzese was involved in. We also look at the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the popular horror film. Now, back then, when Texas Chainsaw Massacre was put out in 1974, this was a very new type of film. There weren't a ton of horror films out, right? You know, you don't have these type of films. Sonny Franzese would put about $100,000 into this film. That was the budget of the film. He paid it. It ended up making $31 million. This is from Sonny Francis. He was a part of two of the most important films of all time in really what they were. This was one of the first really great horror films. He was involved in one of the really great porn films during the golden age of porn. This made him a very rich man. Um, now let's kind of take ourselves to, to 2004, which is when things would really start to come undone for, you know, a very old uh, Sonny Frenzies. I mean, Sonny Frenzies is his late 80s at this point, um, but he would not lose his title. By 2004, 
that he would again get the underboss title uh, after the current uh, underboss of the family at that time, Jackie DeRoss, would go away. Uh, he would get back to being the boss. However, uh, in May of 2007, he would again return to prison on a parole violation. So, you know, he was again, you know, hanging out with the wrong people, people that he shouldn't be with. Um, and in June of 2008, he was still incarcerated, but he would be indicted in charges of participating in murders during the Colombo Wars in the 90s uh, and other mob crimes. Um, he would be indicted along with um, different uh, Colombo people, including uh, Thomas Gioli, who was the boss at the time. In late 2008, he would be released from MDC. Now, I want to kind of talk about the kind of guy that Sonny was, because we've talked about how he was a great businessman. We talked about he was a good father. But we have to remember, Sonny Franzese was a stone cold killer. As I said, it was said that Sonny Franzese killed up to 50 people, maybe more. Um, and when we think about the Colombo crime family, I think we have to look back and say to ourselves, this was probably one of the more violent families. I mean, as far as all the, I mean, think about the killers in this family, Greg Scarpa, Sonny Ranzese, Joe Waverly, you know, all these different, I mean, these are some violent people. And they've killed hundreds of people. In 2006, Sonny Ranzese would be hanging out with an individual called Guy Fatato. Guy Fatato was an associate of the family. Uh, the problem was he was a rat and he had been taping the conversation. Franzese would be quoted as saying, quote, I killed a lot of guys. You're not talking about four, five, six, or 10. He would also tell Fatata that he would put nail polish on his fingertips before a murder to avoid leaving fingerprints, which is obviously very smart. We have to remember this is the 2000s. We have a lot more. This isn't the 20s or 30s, like when he was growing up. He would also suggest wearing hair nets during a murder. So to avoid leaving hair strands at the crime scene, that you could get DNA analyzed from. He would say, today, you can't have a body no more. It's better to take that half an hour or an hour to get rid of the body than it is to leave the body on the street. Now, he would also discuss how important it was to deal with the corpse of your victim. He would discuss that you have to dismember the corpse in a little kiddie pool, dry the severed body parts in a microwave oven, and then run the parts through a uh, garbage disposal, which... Again, very smart if we're looking to kill somebody. Now, again, none of us are, but this is what he believed, and these were his quotes. Um, during all this as well, John's son, uh, John Jr., was involved uh, in life. Um, and I think out of the two sons, when it comes to Michael and John Jr., Michael obviously was an earner, and we'll do a show on him at some point, but the problem that Sonny Frenzies had in dealing with his other son, John Jr., John Jr. was not cut out for the life. Um, this was a junkie. He had HIV. Um, this was a guy that could not be trusted. This is a guy that would break. This is a guy that if the FBI went to him, he would break in a fucking second. And the FBI went to him with this. We'll get you better. We'll help you. We'll save you. We'll save your father. And they get him to start cooperating. So in 2008, um, obviously he had been out of prison by this point. Um, during the 2005, 2006, 2007, all that time, John Jr. would actually cooperate against his father and wear a wire. It was said that he would receive money for doing this as well. Something that he would contend that never happened, but he would testify twice against his father, um, saying that, you know, he had to live under protection because he thought that his father was going to kill him, which there was no proof of that. Um, and in January uh, 14, 2011, he would be sentenced to eight years in prison. Now, all this would stem uh, for Sonny Frenzies for extorting uh, strip clubs. He was uh, said to have extorted uh, Penthouse, Larry Friends Hustler Club, uh, and all this stuff John Jr. was involved in. Uh, he would testify and say that he saw him do it. He would also discuss that uh, Sonny was running a loan checking operation and extorting pizzerias on Long Island. Um, now, the prosecutors would ask for a longer sentence because they believed um, that, keep in mind, at 93, if you give him 12 years, it's likely that Sonny Frenzies dies in prison. Um, by this point, it was said in court that Sonny would fall asleep. Uh, he had all sorts of issues. He was um, got heart and kidney problems. He had blindness. He was really breaking down physically. 
Um, he would even in 2016 file for compassionate release about five years in, but he would not get it. But on June 23rd, 2017, the unthinkable would happen with Sonny Frenzies. He would exit prison, still alive. He did the entire sentence, uh, just a little under six years. Uh, and at the age of 100, he would be released from FMC Devons in a wheelchair. At that point, he was the oldest federal inmate in the United States and the only 100-year person in federal custody at the time of his release. And by my admission, um, I only think there's one or two other mobsters that live to be 100. Now, there is no mobs that live to be 103, um, which Sonny would end up doing. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, keep in mind, in 2019, Newsmax would do a documentary about Sonny Vrenzies. They would actually interview him. It was actually quite interesting. He would talk about his life and things that he did and didn't do. Um, it's actually quite good if you've ever um, are on YouTube and want to see it. It was also discussed in that documentary that during that time in the nursing home, he would actually reconcile with his son, John Jr. Um, now, there are differing accounts on the reconciliation. John Jr. would say that, you know, it was great and whatever. It seemed like to me, though, Sonny um, didn't really want to talk about it. Now, we have to remember. Did John Jr. rat on his own father? Yes. Do I think it's absolutely deplorable? Yes. But I'm not his son. I'm not his father. Okay. You do things for your kids. And I think by that point, at 100 plus years old, I think Sonny Francis just wanted to die and know that his sons were okay. Do I agree with what his son did? Of course not. I don't agree with the ratting. I especially don't agree with ratting on your own father. Keep in mind, on February 24th, 2020, Sonny Francis would die in a New York City hospital at 103 years old. And as I said, he's the oldest mobster in history. No one ever got that old. Uh, and in a way, he stuck it to the government many times. They didn't want him to live past 80 or 90. He said, fuck it, I'm going to live past 100. I'm going to get to 103. He would be buried uh, on February 28th at St. John's Cemetery. Uh, following a funeral at Our Lady of Mount Caramel Church. And um, interestingly enough, um, he did have a uh, normal funeral. Um, sometimes with mobsters, they will not have funerals, um, but they did in his case. And, uh, you know, the Monsignor would actually talk about Monsignor David Casado. He would bless the casket saying, Sonny die with Christ and he will rise with Christ. As far as what would happen next, uh, the Monsignor would also say that the congregation should pray for Sonny, that he be forgiven for his trespasses, along with the innumerable other horrible things he had done in his life, thereby hopefully escaping hell and joining the company of saints in God's heaven. Um, it was uh, a small funeral, wasn't many people there, but I think at the end of the day, anyone that knew Sonny Frenzies knew the kind of guy he was. He was the tough, stone-cold gangster that I think they all wanted to be. In this day and age where all we hear about is rats, none of them could carry Sonny Frenzies as water. Sonny Frenzies was Kozanosha to the core. John Gotti would once say, Sonny Frenzies, that's one tough fuck, maybe the toughest. John Gotti would talk glowingly about Sonny Frenzies, the kind of guy that he was. This is a guy that knew Marilyn Monroe. This is a guy that ran around with Frank Costello. He knew Lucky Luciano. You know, he met Al Capone. This is a guy that literally made the Colombo family what they became. He took them through many years of war. Went to prison, came out on something he didn't even do. That's what's crazy about Sonny Frenzies. The one thing that he went to jail for, well, at least initially, he didn't even do, at least from my opinion. So when we say the FBI plays by the rules, remember, they don't always play by the rules. Uh, keep in mind, uh, Sonny would actually have um, four more children with Copa Bianco. Uh, and Mrs. Copa Bianco, Frenzies, would die in 2012. Um, altogether, Mike or uh, John Frenzies would have eight kids. He 
now said 18 grandchildren and six great grandchildren. So a big family. Uh, one other funny thing that I wanted to bring up, uh, Sonny Vrenzies would actually be listed as an associate producer on a film called This Thing of Ours, which has uh, James Kahn in it. He's old. Um, Frank Vincent's in it. Vinnie Pastor's in it. Uh, it's a truly terrible movie. I actually watched it last night. Uh, it's really fucking bad. And it's funny because in the YouTube comments, someone commented and said, uh, this is why uh, Martin Scorsese makes the big bucks. And you just look at the film compared to that film and it's like, holy shit. Uh, but yeah, that was one film that uh, Sonny was involved in that was not good. Keep in mind, Michael Franzese is alive. Uh, we'll do a show on him. Um, has a pretty good YouTube channel. And look, I know there's not a lot of people in this space. Um, I don't know if Michael will hear this show. I doubt he will. Uh, but if he does, um, I have no issues with Michael Franzese. I think he had a tough life. Um, I, I think ultimately most of his stories are pretty cool. Um, I like hearing from him. I think he's probably the only one that I kind of can deal with just a little bit. And I hope that he respects the show we did here um i try to be and every time we do a show i try to be as you know factual as possible i know that i'm not going to have the intimate knowledge that like maybe he did or, or someone else does you know but as i've said time and time again whether i agree with what these people do or what they don't do um, now in john franzese's case i think he was a man's man and i think he was what everything cosa nostra is um, but even when we talk about an informant, you know, his brother, John Jr., I don't like what John Jr. did. I think it was a disgusting move. But I also will say that I don't I didn't live their life and I don't know what it was like. Um, my job is to sit here and tell you a story about somebody and try to compel you to hear more about them. So I hope we did a good enough job. Um, John Jr. is still alive as well. As far as I know, he lives uh, in, I think, Indianapolis. I think he's in the witness protection program as far as I know. But you know, really a guy that uh, I think is probably the more fat, most fascinating guy in Cosa Nostra history. Um, a guy that lived a very long life. I've seen a lot. Um, you know, I, I just, you can't talk about the mafia without talking about John Frenzies, Michael Frenzies. Um, they're part of it. I mean, Michael's one of the greatest earners of all time. And his father was no, was no slouch either. I mean, this guy made a ton of money in the music business, the, the movie business. Uh, just, just incredible. Uh, definitely a stone cold G. Um, he wasn't even a boss either. So that's that Sonny Franzese on the sit down. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. I thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, as always, make sure you give us a follow on Twitter at the sit down seven. And look, if you like the show, if you're new around here, or maybe you just haven't done it yet, please give us a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you listen to the show. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you'd like to hear. Uh, and just, uh, you know, show love. That's the goal. You know, tell your friends about it. The, the, the sooner you tell another person and they tell another person, that's how shows grow. And before we end, I want to thank everybody that listens to the show. Uh, we recently passed 500,000 listens on this show. Uh, when I first started it, I never believed that 500,000 people would hear a show that I do. Um, but I thank you for listening. Uh, we wouldn't be anything without you guys. And uh, we're going to keep bringing you great shows about the mob every week. Um, so thank you. I am Jeff Nadeau. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.